Welcome to the Access Board podcast, your best chance to learn more about our students, our teams and our programmes. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Access Board podcast. Myself, Gary Judge, joined by Jordan Neils, our careers lead, and delighted to be joined this week by a slightly different guest. And again, nonetheless interesting, in fact, more interesting from my point of view. We've got John Newby coming to us from Access to Music or Access Creative Lincoln, former musician, well, current musician. Sorry, John, you're not you're not quite finished. No, yet, I'm not quite hung it up yet. No. <laughs> um, again, it, it's it's going to follow a similar thread. We've got someone who's followed this passion, um, and someone who's who's currently got the pleasure of working with our learners, but unfortunately, will soon be moving on. So we're going to cover um, as much as John would like to cover about his career and about his his time with with Access to Music and, and now Access Creative. So, John. How are you doing, first of all? I'm good, thanks. Yourself? Fantastic, yeah. Not, not far off Christmas, short yeah. break. And yeah, again, looking forward to it, yeah. For anyone who's in teaching, this is probably the only time of the year, I would say, that it's an actual break. <laughs> Summer <laughs> isn't, a, isn't a break because you've got all of the incoming students coming in, but everything for me shuts down for a, for a week or so over Christmas, and that's that's quite refreshing. Yeah, John. Um, obviously, it's an it's an interesting story yours of of what I know of it so far. But basically, I think the best place for us to start is you know where did your passion for music come from, and and how did you get started in music? I was, I was trying to sum that up really. I think it started when I was fairly young. Um, trips up north for, uh, up to sort of Newcastle way, where my relatives sort of live. And two of my aunties were very musical. So my mum and my dad did, were totally unmusical, you know. But there was, so when I went up north, there was suddenly these piano, there was a piano there that I used to go and play in the back room. I didn't, I didn't play anything on it. I just played it, you know. <laughs> I didn't know anything. Uh, and there was an oboe and a uh, stuff. And then I think, I always think I had music in my head. I was very shy and stuff. So I'd just walk around with just music in my head, you know somehow I don't know I'm a singer so I, I went on and I, I went through like church choirs and things and so I was always the I was always the guy that ended up I think I've joined the, our local church choir and I just was the guy that ended up i had been in about two weeks and I ended up singing a solo you know with all the other guys that were far older than me so so it's obviously something there something I had a voice and that that sort of thing and I kind of followed that up with a bit of scraping away on a violin for many years, never really achieving anything. Um, uh, to finally get to be about 13, um, move of schools, not of area, move of schools, met up with people who were into this fabulous rock music that I'd never heard in my life until then. You know, so suddenly I'm introduced to, yes, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and wow, what is that instrument? You know, electric guitar being, you know, being played flat out at stupid decibels. And it just it just piqued my interest, I guess. And uh, Sorry, that's, Sorry, John, um, that question. What era are, we, era are we in now, just for the What background? era are we in? We're, we're, we're kind of early 70s. Okay. So well, early to mid 70s, probably mid, yeah, early, yeah. So we're looking at when Led Zeppelin was still releasing, and Pink Floyd was Led Zeppelin still re, still releasing albums. You know, that they, they were the, the probably the top, you know, getting towards the top band in the world at that point. Floyd very much still together and working together. So yeah. kind of buying albums first time round. I think they cost about two pounds twenty or something at that point. But you had to make a serious decision what you were going to buy. You know, that was it. That was going to be your listening for, you know, the next sort of three months till you'd saved up for another one. No, there was no streaming or anything like that. You know, just not not a chance. I so said, there's two there's two things there for me. One was you, you were talking about walking around, just kind of playing music in your own head. Obviously, our, our students and ever in the modern era, and I was walking around with the pods in. Sure, yes. Yeah. Whatever music they want at, at a given time, but. For you, it was kind of almost, I heard this song uh, uh, again a couple of days ago on the radio or whatever, and just trying to keep that going. And it, Yeah, I think it probably was, yeah, that of hearing that. And also, you know, you, you had to be at home to listen to it. You had to put your record on, you know, and 
put it on and you know on the needle goes on part of the thing was actually the needle dropping onto the record which people can probably identify with now because we're going kind of going back to vinyl a bit aren't we yeah, so that yeah. little is like a little introduction to the record <laughs> you know ah we're off music you know but it it sort of stayed there in the background as well so yeah, when, when did it become when did it go from sort of i just you know i've got this natural like for music, you know, there's certain people in my family. When did it go from, like, a, what you call a hobby to something like, you know, that you wanted to do seriously? That I really, really wanted to follow. I think I got to be it's kind of about 15, was with my friends, were all into, you know, rock music, and we, we formed a band. We didn't have any instruments, but we were a band, so we knew what instrument we were going to play, you know, and I... I was going to play guitar because I I was going to be there at the front doing it. You know, I wasn't going to be a guy sat behind a drum kit or a, or standing behind a bass guitar. I was going to be somewhere up the front and probably not necessarily a singer at that point, even though that's what, what I did really when I look back. Um, so, so that was it. So just before what was then, to, what were then called O levels, which were GCSEs now, um, I, just before, you know, sort of revision time, I um, went and bought an electric guitar. <laughs> I got really good on the guitar. <laughs> uh, sadly, not so good in my exams. Um, but there we have, go. We won't advocate that one, John, to some of our listeners. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah th just ignore what I said there, yeah. Um, <laughs> but there, there we go, you know. There, there were no, at that point in time, as far as I know, that the only music courses would have been classical. You know, you'd have gone on playing your violin or the piano or trumpet or something, but you certainly wouldn't have been playing electric guitar on a music course. How did you find being, um, and I'm sure you weren't really thinking about like this at that time, but how was it sort of stepping into an industry where there's no sort of, there's no direct career path as a musician, right? It's just, you know, following your passion and then hoping things break for you. And stuff. I, th I think it's really difficult. I, I, Actually, come. I'm not from Lincoln. I'm, I'm I, I live in a small market town called Louth, which is, you know, at that time there were probably twelve, thirteen thousand people lived there. There was one gig, you know, the the bands played at, uh, which was a tiny little room above a pub. You probably cram. It, it, it was probably nowadays you'd, you'd probably be allowed to have about twenty five people up there. Um, I think you regularly had a hundred people crammed in, you know, just, right. uh, and, and that was the place to go and see music. So it was really, it was a dream, you know, but no idea of how you would ever get beyond that. Um, and then I think I, I started playing in a, with other people. we we finally formed the band, if you like. Um, it changed a bit, you know, as, as people found that they didn't really have an aptitude to play bass guitar or whatever. And I also started singing as well. I, I, I Started singing because I could afford a mic stand at that point. You know, it's very difficult to play guitar and hold a mic at the same time. So that's why I haven't been singing, really. Um, and we, we kind of formed our first band, just guitar, you know, a couple of guitars, bass and drums, and uh, went out into the big wide world and, and started playing in scary places like Grimsby and, and stuff, you know. <laughs> what was your first band called, John? I think I think we were called Fine Jade, and we knew three songs and and carried our equipment down the road to the the hall where somebody was having a party because and we played our three songs about four times each. I think <laughs> that was it, <laughs> which was great. Yeah. As things progressed, you did um, you did find your way down to um, sort of the big world, so to speak, in terms of yeah, yeah, and yeah. pursuing dreams and stuff. What was that sort of path like going from, you know, as you as you say, smaller rooms and then thinking, oh, we could actually be playing to some level of audience? Oh, I, th I think it was was sort of, at the time, sort of everything I'd ever dreamed of. In, in a way, what happened was we, we met a manager um, who, was, who was an industry professional. You know, he'd worked for record companies and stuff, managed a band that were quite famous at the time called The Motors, uh, did a did a probably airport was there airport I don't know so you know, probably don't even know it but it was it's quite a big hit and occasionally still played on radio too so we met a guy who 
could basically walk in any door. You know, he he's, it wasn't a case of sending a little cassette off to somewhere. It was a case of him just ringing up and saying, I've got this band, can we come in and talk to you? So we were, we were very lucky there, really, that we got that sort of introduction via a mutual friend. Um, and suddenly we're sitting, you know, talking to EMI, uh, Chrysalis, I think, were a record company at the time, and a, a guy, a subsidiary of RCA, were just in, you know, these are sort of, were the major record companies of the time. Um, signed a deal, um, but they didn't really want the band. This was the sort of problem in a way, was we were, I think we progressed by then a couple of Charlies, because we both, my friend and myself, who wrote the lyrics, wasn't in the band, um, and I wrote the, the music around it, and we were working on four-track, you know, reel-to-reel tape recorders. So we that's very much what we were about, trying to emulate people like, I suppose we're talking now, 1980s, 81, 82. Mm-hmm. We're trying to emulate those sort of people that were around at the time. Synth pop, I guess, was just happening, really. Human League, all, all those acts were out just breaking through. And that's what, in a way, what we in our heads were trying to emulate. Our manager wanted us to be a rock band and go and conquer America. Um, so it was a bit of a clash of interests. Yeah, I was so just going to Sorry, I think that's the first point where you get somebody, you suddenly realise you can't make all the decisions mm. because somebody's telling you what you need to be doing, you know, and, and stuff. Um, so, yeah, and signed a record deal with a, with a little label called, there were a startup label called Regard Records, and the guy that ran, was running it had just finished being the head of CBS who were like one of the biggest record label, American record labels at the time. And uh, suddenly we have a single being played on Radio 1, you know, which wow. is just nuts. It's complete yeah. abundance. A couple of Charlies with a four track, you know. And we, but we, we, we got to work in some fantastic studios. You know, the old, they're, they're, they're very much going now. They've all but gone. But we, we worked in um, Psalm East, Psalm West which were, I think Psalm East was the first place to have a computer-controlled mixing desk, you know, that had probably cost many more times than a small house at the time, you know, was like the first automatic. You could go back in and recreate your mix. Albeit, even at that price, you actually had to twiddle every single knob (laughs) and look on a screen to make sure it was in the same place. So you imagine doing that for 24 channels with with all the knobs that would be on a channel. And that was state of the art at the time. John, what did you, um, it's, it's interesting for me, especially from like a, a careers and like a development point of view. When it, when, it, when it goes from a hobby into a professional, you know, you're starting to be dictated to by the likes of managers and stuff like that. What do you learn about what people would call like the, the real world, you know, in terms of when it, it does essentially become a business? Well, you you, you learn, the first thing you learn is that everybody wants to have an input. So in your precious material, we used to to record at home and we tried to make it sound as good as we could on on a limited thing. And we had this this image in our head of what it was going to sound like. And we would come down and go in these swanky studios with a a guy who was a producer, there'd be an engineer there, you know, and... uh, suddenly it didn't sound anything like, it didn't really recreate what you wanted to hear. You you went down their route of, oh, I think we should do this, we should change that chord, we should have this sound here. Um, and then when you present it to the record company, you know, the, the A&R guy decides that the bass drum should be louder, you know, or, or whatever, you know, just, just, it's almost like they just need to have an input into it. Some people in a very positive way, you know, you, you work with, um, you know, we work with some great musicians. I suppose the, the one who's most famous now would be a, a woman called Anne Dudley, who's who's won Oscars and all sorts for her scores. And she came in and just played. She came in a, a very old brown suitcase, opened it up. She'd got a mini Moog synthesizer inside it and just um, stood behind the mixing desk and was played the song two or three times. She sort of notated it all out on manuscript paper, the, the, yeah. part, that she, the part she was going to play, and then just played it straight through. 
And then they, there was just said, well, could we do something at the end there a little bit different? And so she fiddled about for another couple of minutes. Done. You know, just incredibly professional. And, and to work with people like that was eye-opening, really. You know, when, when you're working with people who only just realise which way round to hold their guitar and stuff, you know. So a big, big move up in the quality, I suppose, a bit, a bit like suddenly playing with Pelé or something, you know, having played in your local league side. So, yeah, it was a great experience, that. Um, and then obviously going out and playing live, which was then trying to recreate what you'd done in the studio, only with not such good musicians in a way. They they were good. We had a great bass player and stuff. Keyboard player who tended to play with one hand in his pocket. Um, and my friend who wrote the lyrics was in the band, even though he couldn't play a thing. You know, he was on a he was on a mono synth, so he was playing kind of like with two fingers like this on it. Um, a good drummer we had, I suppose, as well. And suddenly there, you know, again, instead of playing your sweaty little club where you probably haven't even got a stage maybe or you're just a few inches above the audience, you know, suddenly it, it, it was like, that we, we, you know, the, I suppose the biggest thing we did, we supported Culture Club. Um, and one of the gigs I remember best was we played at Sheffield City Hall, you know. Suddenly you go out on stage and you, you're just like, wow, where did... <laughs> And it looks like everybody's on the stage, you know, because because you, when you sit in the audience, you feel like you're a long way away. But when you're on stage, it's like it's like oh no, not just one tier, but another. Oh my god, where did all these people come from? You know, and so it's quite a bit scary, really. But really, really good fun, uh, you know, definitely to do that. I, I've been um, I've been told just from some intel as well to ask you about. Um... Orange, your band's Orange. and, and Oh, and I did have a band. Yeah, I had a band called Orange that I, I got together down in down in London uh, when I lived down there. And we went, we played quite a lot of central London clubs, like the th clubs that existed at the time, like the Rock Garden and all that stuff around Covent Garden area. We played quite a few gigs. Um, I think the bass player was out of the Waterboys um, very briefly. Um, and then the the drummer has gone on actually, and he now plays. He's the full time drummer for Squeeze, wow. so he's a great, and fabulous drummer. You know, he's he's gone on and done that. Our manager went on and uh, just for a small gig, he um, he went on and managed Paul McCartney after us. So we obviously prepared him for that gig. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, yeah, I think they long ago fell out, so he's no longer his manager. But yeah, so. Yeah, but Orange was just a little kind of like we played around London, played a few gigs, and then the bass player, I think he had a few kind of problems and things. He left, and the, also the bass player and drummer fell out. So three-piece band, and you have a bass player and a drummer who don't want to be in the same room together. So that, that was the end of Orange. Because that, that's the other thing, isn't it, with bands, is it's, it just seems when you cracked it, people fall out and can't be with each other, you know, and it's it's the bands who can you know, be professional and put those things aside as well, I guess. What did you think, sorry, sorry, Gary, go on, mate, you carry on. Yeah, I was only going to ask you, it's slightly off topic, but you've just mentioned about relationships and I guess the personal and professional boundaries sometimes, you know, we, we get it in sport quite a lot where, you know, you, you'll often have to compete against your friends or, or, or play with people you maybe don't always get on with. Just, just from a, a your your personal point of view and I guess your experience, how, how, how do you deal with that? Just maybe some advice from you. What, what, what was your... I don't, I don't, I don't know how you deal with that because I'm, I'm a very laid back guy. You know, I, I really, people would have to push my buttons very hard to, to get to a point where I fell out with them. You know, I don't, I, I'm really about not falling out with people. So I, th I think you've always got to, You've, you've got to keep a, a mind of the overall target, haven't you? Mm. You know, where you want to be, where you want to get oh, okay. to. And, and if you're forever bickering and falling out, well, you're never, you're never going to get there. And you do need, especially, I suppose, if you're in a sports team, but likewise, in, if you're a band and you're a close-knit band, you need to be all singing from the same hymn sheet, don't you? So if you, you need to work for each other and, and the best teams win 
because <laughs> that's what they do. You know, they they manage to put those differences aside, um, maybe to a point where it just doesn't bother them. It's just purely a professional. You go out and play, you know, and you you play for your team and your colleagues. John, yeah, obviously now you are um, you're at uh, sort of teaching. When did I'm sure was you thinking about that a long time before um, sort of you know coming out of the band and stuff, or was it something that you no. Had? No, I wasn't. I I got, I got to a point where, to cut a long story short, I, I wasn't having a great time down in London. My relationship had gone wrong, you know, and everything. And I lost a job that was quite a good job. Um, and I I kind of ended up moving back to, to my parents' house in, in Louth, in Lincolnshire. And I thought, well, what? And, and the, you know, like the record deal had long since gone. That, that had all... I was getting quite old then. It had been my 30s. So we're talking sort of early 90s, something like that. And I had no, I had no idea what I was going to do, not a clue. Because I, I was, because as far as I was concerned, I was going to be a pop star. And that was that. I didn't need exams or anything, didn't need any backup. And I'd, I'd kind of given that a pretty good go, hadn't happened. So bizarrely, I, my mum saw an advert in the, the local paper. And it said, are you a musician with really good skills on your instrument, but no, essentially no bits of paper to prove to anybody that you're any good at all? Um, and do you fancy, how about teaching? You know, and that was the <laughs> advert. And I, I answered that and found out that it was a guy called John Ridgeon at the time that was setting up access to music, if you like. And it wasn't the music course how we'd know it today. It was it was designed specifically for older people, older musicians, to um, sort of thirty plus to um, train to teach music, or you know, on, on instrumental, on, you know, like guitars and stuff like that. And so I, I did a year. I ended up signing up for the course, and uh, we we did a year long course, which was a bit odd because it was at the the Bishop's Palace in Lincoln, which is down from the cathedral. So musicians are always known for being the tidiest looking people, you know, with hair all over. We're all standing out smoking cigarettes and everything because everybody smoked then, and that was that. Uh, while young sort of ecclesiastical scholars all in robes were walking past us. So it was a strange, very strange mix of, of thing. And then we went out into schools uh, and worked with music teachers in schools and ultimately the kids. So that, that was my introduction to teaching. Um, and at the end of that, that was when I suppose access to music proper was set up. So it'd be sort of 95, I think, something mm. like that. Um, I, I went to see if I could get a job on teaching on the access to music course. Um, as a as a singer, really, as a singing tutor, uh, only to realise in the end that the, there was no provision for singing. There was guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards. There was no and vocal so artist. I actually, sorry, there was no vocal artist. No, vo no, there was no vocal artist. There was literally it was a come and be in a rock band course. You know that was it really. Um, and uh, I did actually mention that. I said I was disappointed there wasn't. So I kind of got this thing where I did. I went and just did a vocal workshop with everybody that was on the course. I think I did a couple, you know, about sort of 10, 15 people in the room at the same time. And having having managed to get that gig, I suddenly thought, well, what the hell do you do now? <laughs> so you have to start planning and preparing. You know, the, the, the course thing at the at the time, the, the assignment briefs were non-existent. It was like, well, you teach singing, teach them what you want. <laughs> <laughs> what was that was it. it. Was yeah. it. <laughs> there was, yeah, there was a probably quite a nice, it would have been a quite nice now, wouldn't it? You know, oh. just to go, well, we'll just do this today and then <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, make it up as you go along. You're the singer, you know what they need to know and do it. And that gradually increased to, a, I suppose, a, a course pamphlet um it didn't help that we were in a in a small primary school that was no longer a primary school um so we had a, like an l-shaped building as you went in and on the left was a children's crash <laughs> uh, on the right was access to music having band rehearsals <laughs> so, 
around about sort of, I don't know, half 12, one o'clock, we used to get constant complaints from the creche because the kids were trying to sleep and couldn't. So it's an interesting thing, you know, while we were there, I guess. And then, so yeah, things move on, I suppose, don't they? We ended up be, sort of half becoming part of Lincoln College. Um, and we were assigned to what were the dungeons because the old police station was there. So we, we taught in rooms with no natural light at all, which I suppose is quite quite familiar for musicians, isn't it, playing in dark rooms with <laughs> no natural light? Um, and it was purely a male course. It was basically lads who wanted to play in rock bands and I suppose like Nirvana and things like that at the time is what they would want to, you know, what they wanted to do and, and learn. Um, gradually the course briefs did come into play to the point where I was teaching singing then, which was a thing. And I think it was, it was like um, you, you did a solo thing, which meant, would mean like singing with an accompanist. Um, so you, by the end of a two-year course, you had to be able to sing three songs solo <laughs> and uh, three songs with a band, you know, like ensemble, I think it was called, you know. And that that was it. That was the course brief for two years of work, sing six songs by the end of it, which that, you can that, imagine many students came in being able to do in the first... When, when they started, yeah. Sorry? I said, yeah, I can imagine many of them could do yeah. that before yeah. they even started. So, so, yeah, and then it's built and it's built. And it's um, it's kind of changed, I suppose, isn't it? Big time. You know, it really has. Um, we, we moved, you know, from the, the, the dungeons up to our new college, you know, where we are now on Silvergate. Um, and we also started to get girls on the course, which was, you know, was really just like a breath of fresh air to be honest yeah. it really was it really it was beginning to be you know more representative of the real world if you like rather yeah. than sweaty boys in you know in, in the practice room or yeah. something and and it's continued to to go the, the you know and and move on i suppose really from there john obviously you've got a lot of experience oh, sorry Can you get something ahead. i don't want to get too far ahead of it yeah just going back briefly, John, when you when you said you moved back up from London and you, you, you had to kind of leave that not that dream behind, but you know you'd lost you hadn't got your record deal anymore. You're moving away from that. Do you ever do, do you still recall on that experience and still do you still use that to this day and and how you've still managed to you know certainly have a career in music. You've still you've still immersed yourself in music your whole life, haven't you? You still. Yeah, I've, I, I have gone on, and I would say now, the the other, I only, I should say that in, I've only ever worked for, I've only ever been part time for access to music, so I've only ever done like a couple of days at the beginning, and I'm now just down to doing one day. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm doing nothing the rest of the week. My, my other side of things is more. I, I built my own guitar tuition business. Uh, which is mainly working in primary schools with kids who are seven to 11. Um, and I've got a massive bump a year this year. I've got 190 kids that I'm teaching in schools, 10 different oh, schools. So, and, and that has been a real passion really to, to teach kids and see them, them come on. And a, and a great number is, it's unfortunate. I lose contact with them obviously between 11 years old and 16 because they go on to secondary schools. But there's a great number of my kids have actually come through, you know, the Lincoln course. Yeah, um, it's So which which has been great to see and, and see them as... The, the only problem is when they come up to you at 16, you know, and some guy's standing there looking you in the eye, you know, <laughs> and, and he goes, do you remember me? <laughs> you know, the last time you saw them, they were 10 years old. It's, it's kind of, well... well yeah, it was, you know, not really. It's, it's really hard, isn't it? You know, I, I, I haven't changed as much, but I, yeah, but it's great. It's great. It's just, that, that, that is my passion, really, is seeing people now move on, you know, and be able to do things that they maybe thought they were never going to achieve, I suppose. No, it's, re it's really interesting, John, and, and sort of 
the I think the interesting thing for me is obviously moving from you know doing the profession and then moving into teaching and, and sort of balancing the both. Like, how do you sort of prepare students now who you think you know? I know you don't have to name anyone, but anyone you see who you think you know may have talent to go and, you know have a real career within music. How do you sort of try to advise them and on t- not in terms of how they play, but sort of what comes with the industry? I think it's difficult. I've, I've not really, I have got one guy who did go on um, and, and he's gone on and he's had a quite a, quite a few years of being a successful guitar in a guitar playing duo called Smith and Brewer. Um, Jimmy Brewer was his name or is his name and and he is a you know fabulous musician but i've i've not really i, I suppose it's an age thing I, I lose nearly all my kids you know go to university properly now yeah. and or you know move on with their education so i sort of lose a lot at that sort of 18 years old you know they may become privately for ages and stuff but um I don't know in, in terms of how you prepare for it. It's a, it's a difficult thing because I, so I'm more concerned now, I think, with like I'm teaching a girl who's about 13 who sings and plays guitar. Um, and it's more trying to now get her to go out maybe to open mics and things like that as a start. You know, get yourself out there. From there, you're probably then going to get offered a few gigs and things like that. So you know, and you get a few gigs with that. You meet other musicians who maybe say, oh, well, you know, I'm from Lincoln Way, you know, come over and do a gig with me over in Lincoln and, and try and build it like that. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult, isn't it? But um, in terms of actually having students who, who are, in, you know, ready to go and try and get a record deal, I've not really worked with any that have done that, to be fair. And I, I think that's a... You know, that's a strong message, isn't it? And it's certainly a message that we, unfortunately, have to, have to give a lot of the time on the sports and football side. Is look, the, the amount of students or learners or people who play music at a young age who go on to become superstars and are, and yeah. are fortunate enough to not have to do anything else are very few and far between. So, you know, it, it's great to speak to someone who, who's managed to pursue their passion and, and to stay connected with that for so long because as you said you you've you've now re- suppose reinvigorated your passion via teaching young people and, and that's that's brilliant to to hear a lot of people unfortunately will whether it's in sport or music might get to 16 18 or 25 or 30 you know they they stop pursuing the dream and and they have to go and and this is no um i'm not belittling this career pathway but they have to go and work mm. on a building site or they have to go and work in an office but you know, what's your message to young people who who may be passionate about sports or music or, or the creative industries on how to stay connected to your passion? Well, I, th- I think you, do, you just have to keep doing it, don't you? You have to, you have to be passionate about the, the, first and foremost, you just love it. So whatever level you're going to go and play at, whether it be in sport or whatever, just really enjoy it and do the best you can you know be the best that you can um be aware i think at the same time that that some people may pull you de- try and pull you down because you are good you know there, there is a jealousy thing sometimes that people you know like i have things like well who do you think you are then you know and i'm thinking well i'm just trying to sing that song as well as i can sing it you know and and connect with you and I obviously haven't connected with you have I you know or I've done it the wrong way you know and and so so you will get detractors at every stage you know you just push on through and and if you're lucky enough you know like I mean I was lucky but and by no means made it but I, I really enjoyed that time in my life but I'm I'm not regretting that I didn't become some sort of superstar or something, you know, because I've, I've found something else and it's still music. And in many ways, it's probably not been a life sentence. You know, there's so many people that, that maybe not so much in football, but in music that, that there's no opt out, is there? You sign a contract and you can't hand your notice in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Any other job like now, you know, I've decided I've got – you know, a bit older, I'm sort of financially a bit more secure, so I, I can have my notice in with access to music one day a week. 
you know, if I had a recording contract, well, no, make another album, John, you know, yeah. get out there on the road, do it, you know, because I'm, I'm a commodity, aren't I? So it's quite a hard life in many ways, yeah. Absolutely. Joe, Mr. did you have it? No, it's been it's been really interesting. I think um, you know the learners will be able to take a lot away from it. Not not no, nothing more so than the message you just give mm. at the end there about you know just because um, whether you've got a passion, just because it's not what you might envision when you're younger, it doesn't mean that you know you can't still be connected to something that you're really passionate about and make a you know make a career around it. So yeah, been really interesting, John, and, and thanks so much for your time. Great. Just, and and you, you can make some fantastic friends, you know, lifelong friends, just for yeah. a you'd shared passion for something like sport or music or whatever. Yeah. Well, just, just one more thing from, from me, John, or a couple more things. Just want to say a massive thank you to, to Ben Selway and, and Dan Swin, Swindleburn for, for helping this, you know, helping us come together on this because it's really enjoyable. But secondly, and, and I guess more importantly, you're leaving us, or you're leaving access in the next week or so, as you just mentioned. Any any messages from you to the people you've worked with, to, to future students, to, to previous students, and anything in between? Yeah, all, all I can say is that I've absolutely enjoyed working with everybody I've worked with at Access to Music. I've just found it one of the most inclusive and, and friendly kind of atmospheres and kind of a lack of comp competitiveness, if you like, which is obviously not a great thing in sport, but in terms of teaching, in terms of the staff, you know, there's nobody trying to get one over on you. And, and I've, I've worked with a lot of people and I think, I think we are a, a very friendly team, a, a, you know, access wide, you know, we've, I've met people from other, on other courses and everybody wants to get to speak to each other and stuff. So I think access as a whole, as a family, is very very inclusive and and very, you know, it's, it's it's been a great thing for me. Certainly working for Access to Music, been brilliant. And I think I can say, I've enjoyed teaching nearly all the students. <laughs> 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 There's one or two, maybe the maybe the ones that got away that you couldn't quite couldn't quite get get there with. But yeah, to the students, I'll, I'll miss it really well, really miss it a lot. But um, you know, it was certainly something for me that that gave me a direction and a, and, and kept that passion alive as well. That that's certainly come across, and, and credit to you, John. You, you've now broke the record for our longest podcast so far. <laughs> and, and I, didn't even, I didn't even notice the time, so uh, all credit to you. But it, it's been thoroughly enjoyable and 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 definitely entertaining. And and just on behalf of everyone on Access, just want to say a massive thank you for your yeah. for your service and and for your continued service to music. Oh, th thank you, Gary, and thank you, Jordan. That's that's lovely. Thank you. Cheers. Take care, John, and best yeah. of luck. Thank you. Take care.